Hello everyone, welcome back. Hope everyone is still doing well. And uh, in this first lecture of the second last week of the course, what I want to do is just continue to, to develop uh, ideas for the fourth project in this course. I want to show you some things, learn some things myself about processing, uh, and then also um, do some more things with um, live coding and finish up by showing how we might do some video documentation of both of these practices since submitting video documentation is an important requirement uh, of the fourth project. So I'm going to get started with processing and I'm going to, as I always do, I'm going to start by putting in my empty template and running it just for that initial endorphin boost. Sure enough, it works. Um, and I'm going to do what I think many of you should be doing if you're choosing to do a processing thing for that project, which is using the processing reference in order to learn about new instructions, new to you anyway, other instructions in the language, uh, and then take those and experiment with them and see where you can go with them. And what's so good about this procedure is that, well, two things really. This is bricolage programming by, by building up from little things that we tinker with and that we get used to, we might arrive at results that surprise us, um, which are more interesting or, or different or which teach us something um, about the space of generative interactive art or the space of the world or the space of programming that we didn't expect if we had just stuck to a particular plan or if we had set a rigid objective for ourselves. And of course, because you're doing these projects as part of a class, when you build up from individual things that you understand, then, then you own those things and you're able to express themselves originally with, your, with, with them. Uh, and then there's no concern um, about um, an academic integrity issue or plagiarism, which would be the case if we were taking um, larger chunks of code uh, or, or even whole working programs that other people had, been, had made and modifying them. That wouldn't really be original work on our part. So the reference here, the processing reference, is just a, a great place to start. And you know, no one knows, maybe or very few people know what all of these functions do. Uh, I certainly don't know what all these functions to do. So today, what I'm going to do um, to start with is I'm going to start by exploring some functions that I have never explored before with processing. And as I do that, I'm going to kind of talk you through my own process. So for some reason, I, I've never really worked with um, curved lines in processing. And if I look here in the reference, here in the middle, I see um, Bezier curves and just plain curves. And uh, I'm going to just pick curve, which I've never used in processing before. And I'm going to click on it and read the documentation. So I come to the documentation for curve. And I get a little example. Um, and I see in the example that they're using no fill to make to be clear that there, this is not a shape that gets filled in. And then they're using stroke to set the color of this thing that's going to be drawn. And then they're drawing a curve, must be one of these three curves we see here. And then they're setting the color again and drawing another curve, setting the color again and drawing another curve. When I read the description, it tells me that it draws a curved line on the screen and that the first and second parameters specify the beginning control point and the last two parameters specify the ending control point. And the middle parameters specify the start and stop of the curve. So um, the idea here, what, what is maybe is not completely clear from the documentation is that we're gonna draw a curve. And so there's gonna be a point where that curve starts and a point where that curve ends. And then to control the shape of the curve, to sort of bend it, as it were, there's going to be two other points that we specify that are control points. Now, the math of that can be quite complicated, but we don't care. Well, what we can do is just experiment with it. So um, if I look at, keep reading down here and look at parameters, I just want to make sure I have this right. It says x1 and y1 
are the coordinates for the beginning control point. So that's not actually a point that's drawn. It's just something that affects how the how curvy the line is. And it says x2 and y2 is the coordinates for the first point. So that's the point where the curve actually begins. And then x3 and y3 is the coordinates for the second point. So that's where the curve actually ends. And finally, x4 and y4 are the coordinates for the ending control point, or a control, I guess, on how curvy the second half of the line is. So let's experiment um, with that. Let's take what we learned there back to processing. I think we're going to need a, a bigger canvas. So I'll make a bigger canvas. And then I'm going to fill, actually I'm going to change the color mode too because I like to think in HSV out of 100. And let's um, fill the screen um, with black every frame first. So I'll draw a rectangle that is 800 and 600 pixels wide and is filled with the color black. And then let's um, set another color, maybe, I don't know, green. So green is about 33% of the way around the color wheel with maximum saturation and maximum brightness. And then let's draw one of these curves. So we have to provide eight numbers is what we saw back here in the documentation. And the middle four numbers are the actual location of our curve. So um, let's go from, let's make the control points the same as the endpoints to start with. So let's go from 100 pixels from the left and halfway down the screen. I'm gonna do it twice. And then 100 pixels away from the right edge and halfway down the screen. And let's see what that looks like. So it's a straight line. And so I'm guessing that it's a straight line because our control points are the same as our um, actual endpoints of the line. Like these two numbers, these are the control points and they're the same as the actual um, points that are the end of the line here too. This one's the same. Uh, I'm going to copy what they did too and use no fill because I saw a funny green line around the edge of the screen. Actually, I still see it there. Actually, so I think that that funny green line that we're seeing is not related to the fill. It's actually related to our control points being the same. Anyway, um, to figure out how this works, why don't we do it interactively? So uh, here, these are these two points, These control, this control point here is just a point somewhere on our canvas. And early on, we saw that we could also generate those numbers from the mouse position. So if I do that, now my, that first control point is gonna come from the mouse instead of being hard-coded as 100 by 300. So let's try that and see what happens. Now I can move the curve with the mouse. So when I put the curve right there, we get the straight line. When I move it up, it curves downwards. And when I move it the other way, it curves upwards. And when I move it over, doesn't change it that much. What happens if I circle around it, make a big circle around it here? And what if, and see I'm asking that question, what if? What if we use the same control point for the other end of the curve? I'm sure it's not meant to be used this way, but I just wanna see what happens. Well, isn't that interesting? We get a very symmetrical curve if we do that. And if we put the two lines closer together, if I take the end point of the line and put it just 200 pixels to the right, so it's a very short line, how does this work then? Looks more curvy, but still not that curvy. Like it's hard to, if I move it right to the bottom of the canvas, I can kind of make half of a circle. But if I wanted to make this an even steeper curve, I think I'd have to go much, much further away. 
which I could do if I took the mouse y and I multiplied it by 10. So I'll try that. Now I don't have to go very far away for this to be a, I don't have to go very far down for it to be a very long curve. It doesn't work so well in the other direction. Okay. Um, and while I've been doing this, I've been thinking about the green, the faint green line that we see at the edge of the screen. And I realized that that's not, doesn't have anything to do with our curve. Um, it's because we're setting a stroke color and then this draw thing is repeating. And so when we come back to the rectangle the next time around, it's still got that stroke color. And so the rectangle is getting a green outline. We should use no stroke here to get rid of that. So our rectangle is filled, but it doesn't have a stroke on the edge. And our curve is has a stroke, a, a line in it, but it, it's not filled. So I bet you that our green outline has gone away. Yeah, it has now. Great. All right, well, how can I take this further and make this an interesting piece? Um, what if I started experimenting with bouncing around like we were doing in other things? If I make a model of bouncing objects and what if it's not just the, um, the points of our curve that bounce around, but also the control points that bounce around? That might be kind of interesting. Um, or maybe the control points could be random. Let's start by just making the ends bounce around. So I'm gonna make a curve. I'm just gonna make one point of the curve bounce around. So that'll be very similar to what we did in another lecture. So I'll make variables for the initial X position of the curve, maybe the middle of the screen, and variables for the initial speed of the curve, speed of this thing moving around. So let's say um, three pixels and four pixels per frame. And then I'm gonna have rules that modify the variables. So we can say, for example, if the X position is greater than the right side of the screen, then X speed becomes its opposite, multiplies by minus one. And also if X goes to the left side of the screen, we multiply it to get its opposite, so it changes direction. And then we do the same thing for the Y as well. And I'm gonna be very careful copying and pasting for myself here to change all the X's to Y's and to change that limit where the Y speed bounces to 600. And then having modified that, we will add the X speed to the X every frame and we'll add the Y speed to the Y every frame. And then we have drawing. That's what we already had when we started. And I'm gonna draw um, I'm gonna let's do this. This is just a crazy idea that came to me. Let's make the first control point controlled by the mouse. Let's make the second point the X and Y that we're determining with our model, our simulation up here. And let's make this the second point just be the center of the screen always. So that would be 400 by 300. And then finally, let's make the last control point random anywhere on the screen. So I'll do math random 800, a number between zero and 800 for the X position of that control point and math random 600 for the other one. So I'm, I'm breaking the rules of bricolage program a little bit. I'm kind of putting a, a bunch of crazy changes in together at the same time, but I guess I'm just feeling enthusiastic today. There you have it. So let's see what happens. Oh, I got an error. Oh yeah, it's not math.random. That's me thinking in JavaScript instead of processing. Sorry, it's just random. Okay, now that's pretty cool. It's like a kind of oscillating 
vibrating thing and it should be affected by me moving the mouse, although it's, it's not affected that much by me moving the mouse. I think po possibly because the randomness um, that we're adding is, um, is having such an effect on what we see that it makes it hard to see the effect of moving the mouse. So again, now in the spirit of bricolage programming, that makes me think of something to try. Like I just said it out loud. I was not sure if the mouse was having an effect because maybe the randomness that we're introducing elsewhere is making it hard to see that effect. So, so that, that's all, my mind has already come up with the next step, you see. Um, I wanna do something that explores that idea I just had. So the next step that I've got in mind is to make both control points random to see if it looks any different. And if it really looks the same, then it, I think that tends to support my hypothesis that the randomness is making it hard to see the mouse effect of the mouse motion. I mean, it looks a little bit different now. It looks, in a way, it looks almost more regular now than it did before, um, but it's subtle. So let's, let's go with that. Let's go with that random, which means that maybe we could use mouse position to represent something else. Um, let's, leave it, let's leave the mouse position aside for now and come back to that. So in, in some other um, tutorials, we showed some transparency effects where instead of everything being drawn afresh with every frame, we see some of the previous drawing there before. And the way we did that was by erasing the screen, not with a completely opaque rectangle, but with a partially transparent rectangle. So if I add another parameter to this uh, fill, it will tell me how transparent um, my drawing is. And so instead of drawing a 100% opaque black rectangle, I could draw a 5% opaque um, black rectangle. And what will happen is that everything will just slowly fade to black. And if we want it to slow more fairly, slowly, we can reduce that number. If we want it to, to fade more quickly, we can increase that number. So I think that's enough of a change. I'll just make a little comment to myself here, like mostly transparent black to make things fade away slowly. And I'm gonna see what this looks like now. Looks kind of like an old fashioned oscilloscope. I think it looks pretty cool. I think it'll look even cooler with color changes. And so a second ago, we were talking about um, how the, the mouse motion wasn't having an effect anymore. Maybe we can bring the mouse motion back as a way to change the color of this thing. I'm gonna go with that. So here's where we're determining the color of what we're drawing. And we, an interesting little problem that I'm sure many of you will encounter in these projects if you do a processing type project comes up. And the problem is that the range of mouse X and mouse Y isn't the same as the range of our color values. So we can't just directly use mouse X and mouse Y as a color value. If my mouse was at the right edge of the screen, X would be 800 and we said that our color values, <clears throat> we said that our color values were gonna be out of 100. So we need to do a little um, math to, to make those ranges add up. Um, if we want a range from zero to 800 to be a range from zero to 100, we just have to divide everything by eight. And if we want a range from zero to, um, for 600 to be a range from zero to 100, we just divide it by six. So what I'm thinking is we make the hue affected by the mouse X position divided by eight, and we make the saturation divided, uh, the, the Y position divided by six. And I'm gonna put this comment as a note on the next line instead. It's really useful to make comments as you go to confirm your understanding of what you're doing and also to communicate your understanding to others. Okay, so now everything's white because I guess the saturation, which is the Y position is pretty low, but as I move down, it should get more rainbowy. 
and as I move to the right, it should get it should be bluey and it comes back to red around here. So like if we're over here, it's red. Here's rainbow red. And then about a quarter of the way across, it'll be, um, sorry, a third of the way across, it'll be green. And then a two thirds of the way across, it'll be blue. And then all the way across, it will have come around the color wheel again to, to red. So that's cool. So I like that so far, but I'm going to keep going with the bricolage because this is how you make a cool project in this type of space. It's just by not stopping, by getting something and then thinking of what change you can make next and thinking of what change you can make next. And I'm not sure that I'll do this today, but one thing that you can do is to add other layers to the piece too. Um, a lot of the things that I think I've demonstrated in these lectures have been very pure in the sense that they have had one or maybe two elements in them. But nothing stops us from making pieces that have four or five or six different layers that are moving against each other with various complex effects. Today, however, I want to keep exploring this curve just a little bit further before we shift to talking about um, some more ideas about live coding projects. So the one thing I notice about this, and again, in bricolage programming, what you're always doing is making observations about what's there and then using them to inform your next step. One thing that I notice about what's here is um, that the curve is very constrained. I guess with what we're doing with the um, with how we're generating those curve points, the curve control points on the beginning and end of the curve line, I guess those values are close enough to the actual beginning and ending of the curve that we don't end up with like a, a super big curve, just a kind of big curve. So although, all I although I like this effect, I wanna see what happens if I make those control points even further out. And when we saw, when we, were, we, when we were experimenting with those curve control points a second ago with the mouse, when they were controlled by the mouse, we saw that we really had to go outside of the frame to get more dramatic curves. And um, that was, we kind of did that just by multiplying it. But what if we want to go outside of the frame in the negative dimension? I think we're going to need to do a little bit more math there. So if, and if we put that math right here, replacing these expressions, this line is gonna get really long and really hard to read. So I think that we might use um, a variable right here inside the draw to, um, to control that. Let's, let's call it um, control x1, and we're also gonna have control y1, and then we're gonna have control x2 and control y2. And we're gonna fill those in in a second. We're gonna I'm gonna put equal signs here, and we're gonna we're gonna put some stuff here for how we generate um, those numbers on each frame of the drawing. And then I'm gonna put those val those variable names here, and that keeps this line, the one that I'm working in, line um, 22, sorry 29. It keeps that line relatively simple. Uh, the complexity that we're adding is we're adding it on, on separate preceding lines. And so that just helps this thing stay manageable for us is one thing. And maybe if we want to reuse these numbers for some other reason in another drawing operation, we could do that too. But right now, mostly I'm doing this to help my, to help my thinking. So the first one, this is what we had. This is the status quo. We had random numbers between 800 and 600 for each of these parameters. So I'm gonna run that just to verify that it's the status quo. Sure enough, yep, still works the same way. And now what I wanna do is make this a much wider range of numbers, including negative numbers. So um, I I'm gonna take that number and I'm gonna multiply it by four, which would make it a number from zero to 3,200. I'll put this in the comments here, zero to 3,200. And then I'm gonna subtract half of that, or 1,600. And that's gonna make it minus 1,600 to 1,600. And you know what, I'm gonna do the same thing with all of them, because why not? This is, we're, we're making this up as we go along. We're experimenting, seeing what we get. 
and then making other changes. So there's no reason to overthink about whether this is the right thing to do or not. And there's also no reason not to kind of mix up our parameters for the X and Y a little bit here, because it's an experiment. Okay, what's this gonna do? I do not know. Well, we've certainly got a much bigger range of curves now. So I guess that makes sense. That's more or less what I expected. We've still got the bouncing, but the bouncing is not as clear maybe as it used to be because of how, um, of how much more salient the curves are. It makes it a little bit more difficult to see the bouncing, which is kind of interesting, I think. What would happen if we made this really, if we made the curves even, even bigger curves by using bigger numbers and then, and then made them fainter so that they're not as easy to see when they draw. So it's, and I'm think I'm wondering whether that would make a kind of shifting, undulating, um, abstract texture. Let's try those things um, in two steps. So first step, I'm just going to make the numbers a lot bigger. I'm going to add, I don't know, let's, let's multiply this by 40 instead of four. And then that's going to be 32,000. So we'll subtract 16,000. And I'm going to try that. So now our curves should just be all over the place. Yeah, it's interesting. So they are all over the place, but we can still see that they're curves. And we can still see that the center isn't moving. And we can still see the bounce as well. So I think those things are interesting. Even though we've done something that's kind of um, um, really changed the identity of the piece, there are still some things that are pretty easy to see about the piece. And now let's go for the... Um, semi-transparent drawing. So up here, when we set the stroke color, instead of making it 100% that color, I'm going to make it 25% that color. 25% um, opaque, or in other words, 75% transparent. What's that going to look like? Well, it doesn't look that different. But I do like it better this way. It's more subtle somehow. And I feel like that with the extra transparency on the writing, I can see what's happening at the location that's bouncing a little bit better than I could before. And so now I'm, I'm experimenting with the colors by moving the mouse around. And this is making me think of another variation. What if we made the mouse affect the color, but we also made it affect the second position, the second point of the line? or the center point, so that the center, one of the points is bouncing around, but one of the points is always where your mouse is. So, you know, see, sometimes you get ideas about another step you can take with a piece just by the way that you interact with it. So here, instead of always having that second point be 400 by 300, I'm gonna make it mouse X and mouse Y. And then I'm gonna try that. So right now everything's going up to the top left corner because I haven't put the mouse over the canvas yet. And now, I can kind of follow the, the bouncing one with my mouse if I want, or I can stay put somewhere for different effects. can stay in the center if I want to have the effect we had initially. So I think that's a, that's a net addition to this project. Like before we had a project where it had this thing where everything, there was a central focus and there was something bouncing around the central focus. And now we've made the project a little bit interactive, by inc more interactive by including the mouse position in a certain way. And um, we still have what the piece could do before, but now we have more things that it can do as well. And at this point, I think one final impulse comes to me for this piece, which is um, to see if we could make it more intense. So right now what we're doing is we're drawing one curve on every frame of the animation. But in our first tutorial on this, we saw the use of loops to do something repeatedly in the same frame. So what if instead of drawing one curve, I drew 
16 different random curves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a for loop. And my for loop needs a variable that will be an index variable that will tell us and will tell us and processing where we are in the loop. And n will start at 0, and we will continue the loop um, so long as n is lower than 10. So we're going to do it 10 times, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And every time around the loop, n goes up by 1. Then I'm going to put some curly braces, and everything in the curly brace is what's going to happen those 10 times. So I'm going to indent the generation of our curve points and the drawing of our curve. So now what we're going to do is every frame we're going to draw 10 random curves given that bounce position and mouse position. And let's see what that looks like. Definitely busier and definitely cooler. Like now this is now this is officially cool, I think. I feel like uh, I'm moving around some kind of like almost insect like entity here, like a, a mosquito or a spider or something like that. Maybe I could make it even more persistent. That would be fun. So right now things are fading away still pretty quickly. And how fast things are fading away is controlled by this the level of transparency on that black rectangle we're drawing every frame. So I'm going to cut that down to 1% so things really fade away slowly. And we get that. You think about it, on some level, this piece is a little bit like a video game in the sense that we have, um, we have a one thing that is bouncing around by itself according to the rules of, of a, a very simple physics model. So that's kind of almost like a non-player character. And we have another thing, another point, the other end of the curve here, or curves, that is moving according to my control. So it's kind of like a player. So this is almost like a very abstract video game without a goal. And it sure is generating pretty visuals. Well, I keep saying it'll be the last thing I want to do with this, but I can't stop. So I, there's one more thing I want to do. We, we, we made it more intense by drawing more curves. We were drawing 10 curves every frame instead of one. How far can we go with that? I don't know. Let's try. So what if we draw 100 curves instead? This might be too much for the computer. We'll see. Well, I think it's still holding up OK. Now it's a very different piece. Now they don't look like curves so much as, um, I don't know, stars, points of energy. And so that phenomena, whereas we increase the number of lines that we draw, we start identifying them as different things visually. I think that that's an example of emergence. Like we haven't, we haven't even really changed the rules much. We've just changed a numerical quantity within the rules, and yet we get quite different visual results. Well, that's as far as I want to go with that one. Um, I think I'm going to shift now to talking about how we would document a piece like this if we had developed it ourselves from scratch and we were going to submit it. Obviously you all can't submit this because I made it, um, but you can build up your own things by experimenting with the types of things we've been showing here. What you would submit would be your meta commentary, of course, and you would submit your code, this code file, you'd save it and, and attach that, put that in a zip folder. Uh, but you also have to submit video documentation. And the reason why we want video documentation for these pieces um, is because it's, it's not always easy to guarantee that code will work the same way on different machines or in different systems. And so submitting the video documentation uh, is a way of flattening out that problem um, and having guaranteeing that we can see your work as well as the work that went into it. Uh, and I also think that with these pieces, when they have an interactive component, 
um, and then the artist provides some video documentation, what they can do is interact with the piece in the way that they think we should interact with the piece. And it's just an extra layer of communication about how this piece works. So there are different pieces of software for capturing your screen. Right now, I'm using QuickTime Player to capture um, the screen and my microphone on this Macintosh computer. But software that I recommend for lots of people that works on all kinds of different computers is OBS or OBS Studio. And when you first launch OBS, you probably will get something like this where there is um, an empty screen and here in the sources it will say nothing. But if you click on add, you can pick from different media sources um, that you're either going to live stream or going to record. For our project, you'd be recording it. And uh, you'll get slightly different results and slightly different options on different operating systems. So that's something to explore and ask about if you encounter any problems. Uh, but here we've got w window capture. Um, and so I think that's what we want. Oh, we've got display capture. We probably want that. Display capture. So we click that. And sure enough, that's my screen with my with my piece over there. And if I move this out of the way, we'll see that that's what we're getting. Yeah. And so then um, if I don't want to record audio, I can leave it at that and I can go to settings and then output and then recording and here I can choose a container format so here's M M move and mp4 are both available as container formats and then I can choose a video encoder like here I'm using this h264 encoder and here I can set a bitrate and I can experiment with the bitrate to make a file that's the right size for me and I can choose where that this movie goes here and when I'm happy with all that I'm not going to do it because I'm already recording with QuickTime I can click start recording and then demonstrate my piece for a few minutes and then click stop recording um, when I'm done you can use this same software and this same technique to do fancy live streams to YouTube and other live streaming services by the way I really like this software and it's completely free and open source too by the way um, so since we're not going to come back to this now, I will just say um, um, two things. One is that when we add the display to the screen here, it doesn't always come up as the right size. I make this mistake all the time. So if I actually want to capture my whole screen, I should make that a bit smaller, line it up there, and then put it out like that. And you, you notice here that it, when I fill the screen vertically, it doesn't fit. And that's because the aspect ratio of my screen and the standard 16 over 9 aspect ratio that the software is targeting here don't match. So I think one thing I could do is just move it over to center it. Um, another option would be to change the aspect ratio of the output in OBS. Uh, I think either way is fine. And the second thing I wanted to say about this is just about audio capture. So if I, if I add here, I can see audio input capture and audio output capture. And whether that works or not and how it works will be very different from one computer to another. Um, so just wanted to flag that if you're doing a live coding performance and you're using this software to capture the sound, you definitely want to experiment with that um, now and not the day the project is due because there could be some little problems to solve around audio capture in particular. And I'm happy to help if people send messages about that. So I'm going to exit OBS and I'm going to throw away my processing sketch. I'm going to delete it with great abandon because I don't care. Could always make a new one and a different one tomorrow. And I'm going to close processing and I'm going to fire up the Chrome browser and do some live coding for another way to do this project instead. And again, try to take things a little bit further than I've taken them in other other lectures here. So I'm going to fire up S3 and I'm going to go to solo mode. And this is the panel where we have learned to do a few things over the last few weeks. And because it's just me and I can only do so many things at once, I want, I'm going to change the view to a view where there's only two places to enter my code. If I go down here to the terminal at the bottom, and I put an exclamation point and the word preset view and then two columns always one word, the view will change to this. I'll just get two places and it's going to be easier to see um, any visuals 
that I make. So as I've said on other occasions, I think the process of making a live coding project for this course is mostly about practicing, AKA finding interesting material to explore. And so what happens is you do that a bunch and then after you've got some material you're comfortable with, you come back and make a performance out of it that you record with some video capture software, video and audio capture software like OBS. So that's a bit different than what we were doing a second ago in processing. In processing, we develop some things and we keep developing it and then our, our document that we have there, that's, that's kind of the main artifact that we're submitting along with the video documentation. But when we do a live coding performance, it's more, it's more like there's two separate stages one where we're finding interesting stuff and another where we are um, then turning that actually into a performance, for example, with a beginning and a middle and an end or at least some different moments inside of it. So let's do that same thing here now. Let's start in the developing interesting material mode and then let's later take that to the performance mode. And just like we did with processing, um, I think it's a good idea to, to, to just go to some basic materials that we haven't worked with before and, and experiment with them. So um, I think that in the case of working with Tidal, um, there's lots of different samples that are available there, um, many of them provided by Alex McLean, the original um, creator of Tidal. And we can see what those... Um, samples are mostly there's some extra ones in estuary but we can see what most of them are by going to github.com title cycles dirt samples with a dash in the middle of it and what we'll find when we get there is a a whole list of folders and if we were to go in one of these folders on the web we'll see some files in there each one of those is a sound sample and so it might be fun to explore one that we haven't explored, uh, or I haven't explored before. I don't know, I'm just looking through the list here. I'm not sure if I've worked with Electro One before. So I'm gonna check that one out. So I'm gonna go back to Chrome, and I'll make my font a little bit bigger for you, there you go. And I'm gonna make a pattern that's just Electro One. I don't know if that worked. I didn't hear anything. I'm going to go back to a sample I do know, see if that works. Oh, it is working. It's just going to my, to my headphones. Let me um, fix that. So I'm going to go to System Preferences and set the sound output to the built-in output here. Okay. Now let's try Electro One. I don't know how well you can hear that over my CPU fan, which is working hard. It's kind of like a cymbal sound. And if I go back to GitHub and look inside Electro One, I'll see that there's actually quite a lot of samples here. How many are there? There's 13 samples numbered from zero to 12. So right now we're listening to the first one, I presume. And I can put a colon after the sample name to try the other ones. So this was zero. That's what we're listening to already. This is one. This is two. This is three. Four. I'm going to go to loud dynamics here so it's easier for you to hear. So it seems like seven is a kind of bass drum.
All right, so I'm gonna make a pattern of these. Put some kind of bass drum. Maybe just a pattern. I'll put the bass drum in the beginning and just put some random other ones elsewhere. And it's Electro 1, not Electro. I better remember that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So, I've explored a little bit. I've got a pattern, simple beat, with some samples that I haven't worked with before. What am I gonna do next? Well, I think a fun thing would be to um, change the sounds of some of these samples in different ways. So something I don't think we've seen before, but those of you who have been learning Tidal independently will have seen will be um, the shape parameter. So we use the hashtag sign to combine this pattern with another pattern. And this pattern is gonna be a shape pattern. So just to demonstrate the effect, if we put shape 0.5, everything's gonna get a bit louder and distorted. Only a little bit louder. We better increase it even more. If we increase it to 0.95, it should be quite loud and distorted. Or 0.99. One is the maximum. If we wanted, we could have the shape be a random number between zero and one. Instead of putting a pattern there, we put rand. What would it sound like if we did this twice at the same time, one in the left speaker and one in the right speaker, with the one in the right speaker twice as fast as the one in the left speaker? That kind of cowbell-like sound that comes back and again sticks in my attention a little bit. Okay, so that's interesting. It's a kind of percussive texture. Now my musical brain kicks in and says, wouldn't it be nice if there were some pitches or something in this? And so even working in one window, I can use stack and I put some square brackets to have multiple patterns separated by commas. And so I'm gonna to add to this another pattern and I'm gonna use the RP sample. And I'll just put four RPs per bar for now. And one of the fun things about working with pitch is then we can start to move the pitch around using note. For example, if I put note three, it moves up. Put 12, it moves up that much. And we've seen before that we can make chords by putting multiple pitch shifts in brackets separated by comments. And then we can make chord progressions by doing some math on that. We saw this in another one. So maybe I take that chord and I add to it a number that changes each cycle. There's a lot further we could take this. Um, 
Uh, and of course, there's lots of ideas you can get on the Tidal Cycles documentation page. Um, but I think that where I want to stop for today with this is to make that transition from doing this as developing material to doing it as a performance. So let me just um, comment this out for a second. Oh. Comment it out. I'm going to put it back so we can talk a little bit with some quiet. Um, so we developed some material, say, and we developed a particular pattern based on this sample and another pattern that we had going at the same time based on this sample and this chord progression. So if I was going to turn this into a performance, what I might do is put some notes about that on the side, like on a piece of paper, or I guess over since I'm not using the second window, I could put it over here in the second window and not evaluate it. And then I would think about building up to something like that slowly, step by step, in a performance, and then taking it apart instead. So now I'm going to try and do kind of the same thing, but in more of a performance mode. So maybe I start with just one of these sounds, like the bass drum. Maybe I'll let that go for a little while. And then before people get too bored, maybe on the second half of each cycle, I add the one that's on the second half, which is number three here. That's that cowbell sound. And now maybe I add the beats in between. So we had electro one, eight. And you know what? I'm going to add electro one, eight again. So it's symmetrical. So you see I'm departing a little bit from the material I developed, but I think that that's in the spirit of live coding, which is about improvising and about not always doing exactly what your plan is. Well, now maybe I could bring back the number 10 that I didn't use yet by combining it with one of these. So the second beat's going to be both of these sounds sharing that time. I actually think this is better than what I had before. So even though I'm in performance mode now, I'm also still kind of in developing material mode. Like, I think that's one of the things that you experience when you do bricolage programming or when you do live coding is that you can always be learning and taking things further. That the the presentational or the performance element of it doesn't mean that you stop learning. You're not just representing something that you've already done. You're not just repeating your own past labor. You're continuing to work and learn and grow as you do it. Well, this to me feels like the right time to add that pitch element in. So I'm gonna stack that pattern with another one kind of like what we had, I'm going to put that chord in right from the beginning. Now from a performance perspective, I'm thinking that's a nice change. We went from something that had no pitches and no chords to something that does. So that, that's going to take uh, the audience's attention for some time, but only for a some time. That chord is going to get boring pretty quickly. So we better add something to move that around quickly. So I'm going to add to the 0, 4, and 7. Um, I'm adding a different series of numbers on a whim, because that's the kind of crazy thing you can do when you're live coding. So I think we've probably been going for like two or two and a half minutes now. We've slowly built up this musical texture. I could take it a lot further. I think what I'm going to do for the sake of this short demonstration is I'm just going to take it to its more intense place like we planned by juxtaposing a double speed version of the beat. And then I'm going to start taking it apart. Maybe I could do the same thing to my chords as well. Again, we didn't plan this, but that's okay. 
were improvising in the performance. That's a bit of a messy change. It's a bit of a messy change, so I feel like I should back out of it. But another thing I could do is instead of having the speed of the juxtaposed one always be two, I could have that be a pattern too. I could have it like be two, three, four. Well, it's even messier. So now I'm going to start taking things apart. Lots of ways to do this. One way is to start deleting things. Um, another way is to fade things out gradually. So I'm going to take this pattern that's kind of messy and I'm going to fade it out by giving it a gain value that's less than one. And then I'm going to gradually decrease that. Till I can't hear it anymore. To be honest with you though, I should go a little bit further than when I can't hear it anymore, just in case other people can hear it. Because we're all listening under different conditions and maybe our hearing is in different condition. So I can't hear it anymore, so it's safe to delete it. And now we're gonna take this apart and I'm gonna take this apart in a different way. I'm gonna use degrade by and you give it a number, which is how many events to randomly delete. So if I give it degrade by 0.1, it's gonna randomly delete 10% of the notes. I'm gonna increase this gradually. And as I increase it, it's deleting more and more stuff. And maybe when I'm happy now that it's very minimal texture, maybe I finally I'd delete everything and evaluate that. So except for the fact that I was talking over it, I think that that was like, a, you know, an okay little performance there. Uh, and I think if I had spent more time developing material and really finding sounds and patterns that I thought was interesting, I'd be able to make um, an even more impressive and more nuanced um, performance. Um, so I think that's how you go about developing a live coding piece. Um, and maybe you take several takes at it. So I, I would have been video record, video capturing that performance, and then maybe I'd do it another two or three times and submit the best one um, uh, as my project. So thank you for listening, folks. I hope um, that you're well into your fourth projects and that they're going well. Um, tomorrow's lecture, we will turn away from interactive and generative art and we will get into the material of the final postlude of the course proper. We'll talk about the history and future of the internet. Uh, and this will be um, an important part of how we um, frame the question that we are all going to answer during the take-home exam for this course. So thanks for listening. Stay in touch. Good night.